Order! Order! You are an incorrigible delinquent at times. <laughs> Behave yourself, man! Labour's shadow chancellor, John McDonnell, has used his keynote party conference speech to announce a radical revision of the way Labour would fund large-scale building projects. He's pledged that a future Labour government would take control of so-called public finance initiatives. It would mark a huge shift in policy. For 25 years, under both Conservatives and Labour, private companies have built hundreds of schools and hospitals and then been paid to maintain them. Mr Macdonald described the amount of money going to these companies as a scandal. Here's our political editor, Laura Koonsberg. John Macdonald's speeches and his black shades for Labour students. A couple of quid for this speech. But how much to take schools, hospitals, prisons, built and run by private firms, back into public control? <laughs> Jeremy Corbyn's best political friend would be in charge of a Labour government checkbook. And today he promised they'd look at all PFI contracts and take the bulk back into taxpayers' hands. Let me give you this commitment. We'll put an end to this scandal and we'll reduce the costs of the taxpayers. How? Well, we've already pledged that there will be no new PFI deals signed by us in government. But we'll go further. And I can tell you today, it's what you've been calling for. We'll bring existing PFI contracts back in-house. We're bringing them back. We're bringing them back. They loved it here. An audience full of union members. There have been complaints for years about some of the worst deals and companies creaming off profits. We've seen millions of pounds wasted in PFI buildings and contracts. That's money down the tubes. All the money that we are having to pay in interest to big businesses, it would mean that that money could come back into services. Nice. For 20 years, though, Tory and Labour governments paid private companies... This is proceeding on time and on cost. On time and on cost. ..to spread the cost and the risk of big building projects. New Labour now old-fashioned, didn't want to raise taxes to pay. The reason why we weren't doing the investment was we were scared to death of not doing a proper tax policy. That debate better start in an way. way. Mr Corbyn, do we know how much the PFI bill will be? But in Jeremy Corbyn's Labour, PFI would be a thing of the past. The PFI contract you announced today, do you know how much this is going to cost? I'm going for lunch. You heard the speech. You'll see all the details. There's no detail in the speech, was there? How much is it going to cost, sir? The party says they'd buy out private contracts with government bonds or borrowing. When are we going to get more details, sir? But it's not clear how much they'd be willing to do or how many of the existing 700 contracts they'd unpick. The devil is always in the detail. We've got to find out how much this will cost. But I've got no doubt whatsoever that in paying for it, the, um, it will still be better value for the public purse, for the taxpayer, than letting these contracts run for the next 20 years. Do you accept, though, to start with, to take these contracts back mm. in-house? Yes. That would, at least in the short term, cost the taxpayer a lot of money? It, of course it will do. We can borrow. There is nothing against borrowing. Yet this feels more than anything a point of principle. Some of them were badly formed contracts, which have ended up being rather expensive. But you're not going to save money by getting out of them because presumably you're going to have to pay the companies with which you've got the legal agreement in order to get out of them. These days Labour doesn't agree on everything, but the election has given this party new confidence to act on its conviction, not driven by cost. Well, we can talk to Laura now in Brighton. Laura, let's just leave aside the detail for, for a moment. Just how big a change does this represent for Labour? Well, George, in theory, it's a very big change. And chances are, if your child goes to a school with a new building or if you've had a relative in hospital with a new wing, it's probably been built with PFI contract and with PFI money. And certainly, the Labour Party is ready to tear this up. It was one of the principles that Tony Blair and Gordon Brown followed to get lots and lots of cash from the private sector into public building. But that said, after some of the worst excesses of these early contracts in 
emerge, those cliches about the £25 charge to change a light bulb. The contracts had already been reformed and they've already been phased out in Scotland. And as of yet, Labour can't tell us how many of the many hundreds of contracts they would want to tear up and also how much money they would be prepared to borrow to do so. But there's no question here this idea is hugely popular and the leadership believes that with politics shifting it could be very popular in the country too. And there's no question Labour is in buoyant mood and they're ready to push for government and the state to have a much bigger role. Laura, thank you. Now, in his speech to the Labour Party conference here in Brighton, the Shadow Chancellor John Macdonald announced a radical change in the way that Labour, a Labour government, would pay for building new schools, hospitals and prisons. Huge public building projects would no longer be funded by private finance and even existing PFI contracts would be brought back in-house. Opponents said that could be extremely expensive, but Labour insist the taxpayer will make savings. If that policy sounded definite, the Brexit policy was more nuanced. Delegates heard that Labour is flexible on how to retain the benefits of the single market. Our political editor, Gary Gibbon, has this report. <laughs> Like a church icon, his image was paraded in the hall. But there are two gods worshipped here. Jeremy Corbyn is one. The 2017 general election manifesto is the other. The Shadow Chancellor repeated the promises of the manifesto to nationalise rail, water, energy industries and the Royal Mail. But on PFI contracts, he went even further. We've already pledged that there will be no new PFI deal signed by us in government, but we'll go further. And I can tell you today, it's what you've been calling for. We'll bring existing PFI contracts back in-house. We're bringing them back. We're bringing them back. A party statement watered that down, saying some PFIs might be taken over. Mr McDonald's deputy then said the vast majority of PFI would be nationalised. What was clear was that no one knew how much money that would cost. They're all so different. I mean, they range from 10, 15, 20 year contracts. So we will look at all the contracts. Uh, but what we do know from our assessment is that it will be a significant savings to the, uh, to the taxpayer. John McDonald's speech has put up a warning flag over the British economy in terms of being a great place to invest. And that is a problem. This is the sort of thing that will put investment in the deep freeze if, into, if, it, if it is actually implemented and indeed will make a lot of businesses nervous. Nonsense, the veteran Labour MP Dennis Skinner told the conference to wild applause. When the private sector expands, where do you think they get the money from? They borrow it. They borrow it. And they don't take it out of their own safe. When Tesco's expand, do you think for a minute they go to a Tesco safe and get the money out? Of course they don't. They go in somebody else's safe. They borrow the money. Vote Labour. I can't wait for it. All Power to your elbow! Thank you very much. Jeremy Corbyn said fantastic, great stuff. He was notably less enthused in the earlier debate on Brexit when Shadow Foreign Secretary Emily Thornbury joked about Boris Johnson's private life. I, I know that Boris doesn't like paternity tests, but maybe we need one for Brexit. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe we should take him into a studio with Jeremy Kyle. I I'm sorry, Mr. Johnson. <laughs> we got the results back, and it looks like this one's one of yours. <laughs> it must have been that wild night out, yeah, with Michael Gove. <laughs> and I've calculated your maintenance payments, and that'll be £350 million a week. Mr Corbyn likes to steer clear of that sort of personal stuff. There was some airing of party differences over Europe, but, but, but thanks to an operation by the Leader's Office, the no debate or vote on a motion that could have tied him to backing the single market. We will be remembered as the opposition that let the Tories do what they want with Brexit.
We have let Theresa May. We have let Boris Johnson. We have let David Davis get away with what they want in the European Union. I hear comrades saying, stop Brexit. Stop Brexit. Well, I remember that Monty Python sketch. I'm old enough to remember it. The parrot is dead. It is, it is, it, it doesn't exist. It has ceased to exist. You have as much chance of stopping Brexit as Jeremy Corbyn has of wearing my Tottenham shirt. Get real. The man Theresa May thought she would cast into history was today adding to his radical manifesto. Then McCluskey proclaimed Jeremy Corbyn the winner of the election, the moral victor. <laughs> Though cowards flinch and traitors sneer, we'll keep the Corbyn flag flying here. I move. And Gary Gibbon joins us now. Uh, Gary, uh, carapace of unity or deep wells of unity? Um, amazing stuff today because it's not just the scale of the money that John McDonnell is talking about. It's the ambition, if you like. Uh, what he is talking about is uh, moving policy not just back to uh, the beginning of the age of austerity and restoring the cuts or anything else. This is about making an offer uh, of a kind that generally used to be part of the politics of the 1970s, not more recently. And he's adding to it today. And yet, and yet, the voices in the Labour Party, who we all know lurk there and will not like this and will think it is reckless, are silent. And a lot of them uh, have their biggest uh, differences with the leadership that they're willing to explore on Europe, but they're not really willing to articulate those either. It was a really amazing moment in the, uh, there were quite a few moments actually like this in, in the debate on, on Brexit today, when people were beginning to have their heart heartstrings tugged uh, who were Remainers in the hall, and you could just see, you hear the trickles of applause and the rest of it. Someone else would get up onto the podium and start saying, this is not what the leader wants though. And then everybody got up and cheered that. The cult of leadership is binding together Labour on Europe at the moment, and the people who aren't particularly happy or like to push Keir Starmer and others even further on Europe policy, uh, softening it even more. Those people are keeping their heads down because I think they feel if they're waving a European flag under Jeremy Corbyn's nose, that could go down badly. Well, as it happens, the fourth round of Brexit talks began today in Brussels, attended by Brexit Secretary David Davis and the EU's chief negotiator, Michel Barnier. David Davis said Theresa May had shown leadership and flexibility and given reassurances on financial issues in her speech in Florence on Friday. And Michel Barnier called for a moment of clarity from the UK as talks resumed. Well, now we're joined now by Sir Keir Starmer, the shadow Brexit secretary. Uh, Keir Starmer, um, th this has been a most interesting day because it is absolutely clear that everybody in this hall, and possibly many people in the country, want a debate and for a fixed position for Labour to emerge. It hasn't. Well, we've been having a debate, John, for 15 months, and we'll be having a de debate for months and months to go. The Labour Party's been debating this non-stop since the referendum. And we have a position. We had a clear position in our manifesto, which was set out. We then developed that over the summer. I set that out. And the number of people coming up to me today saying, we're in the right place, I support the position we're in, has been really overwhelming. So um, this isn't just about a discussion today. It's been an ongoing discussion. We are now uh, still in the Article 50 stage. There will have to be a transitional set of arrangements for a number of years before we then uh, deal with the final deal. There's lots for us to debate, and we will debate it in the Labour Party. And I've been all over the country talking to party members, but to the constituencies. But the extraordinary thing is we don't hear Jeremy Corbyn articulating single market, uh, staying in the customs union, uh, you know? Well, the position that I set out of the summer was an agreed party position. What we did over the summer was very different to the government. We quietly got to an agreed position that the Shadow Cabinet, that Jeremy Corbyn and I uh, agreed on. Of course, there are different positions in our party, oh, no, different views. That gets views. applauded. You get applauded for whether that when you say it. But then... As soon as he doesn't say it, he gets applauded by the whole well, hall. Well, everybody says it in their different ways, but have we got an agreed position? Yes, we have. Do people support it? Yes, they do. Are there differences of opinion? Of course there are differences of opinion in the party and across the country. Um, my job, in a sense, is to try and bring that together and, and to take us uh, to the sort of constructive, progressive partnership that we need with the EU and to make sure that we don't take the sort of risks that the government is taking on the route.
It's only three or four years ago that you were the director of public prosecutions, a very hallowed job. What on earth has it been like, this journey that you've been on? Well, it's a, certainly a very different environment. <laughs> then there was the sort of rational, evidence-based uh, decision-making by an independent judge. Now we're in the world of politics, where there's much more emotion and passion. Um, but I think... But this is not in, very in, rational here, is it? It, it, it doesn't exactly sense, match your I, old rationality, I, does it? I think our Brexit position has been applauded by businesses, by trade unions and by our party because it is rational. People have said Labour's the grown-up in the room. And we got to that position. And what you saw from Theresa May when she went to Florence is she had to bow to the inevitable position that Labour's right about this. But you see, I have this statement made by the, um, you know, the sort of top knobs in, in the uh, Labour thing. Statement from the NEC on Brexit. It's just what the Bible might call a mess of pottage. Well, it, it's a statement that bring, brings together a lot but of it, issues but it, in it, one But it, it doesn't place. say anything. But I, listen, we, it's silly, really, in a way, to just look at the minutia of today. We've got a very, very clear manifesto mm -hmm. position. We've developed that position. Everybody knows what it was. I set it out at some length today. Could, could it evolve to a situation where if the government fails and decides we're going to stay in the European Union, you could embrace that? Well, if the go I mean, th this government has, has wasted 15 months getting us not very far. Uh, we've now got a transitional set of arrangements. They hope that'll be two years. On their record, uh, they'll be lucky to do it in mm. two years, although it ought to be um, possible. What I'm saying is we've got to get that transitional arrangement right and we've got to get the okay. final deal right. One other big issue today, and that was PFR. Yes. Now, that is a very complex issue. There we have a sweeping statement from John McDonnell that you're going to take the whole lot back into public ownership. This is billions and billions of pounds, and you, as a lawyer, know just what a job that's going to be, unpicking contracts that pledged these hospitals and schools but, would be in private ownership for 20 years. Yeah, John, I mean, the, 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 the proposal is to uh, take a different approach going forward in the future and yes. to review what's happened in the past. Well, he said to take back into public ownership. But it'll be, it'll be a it review. Um, obviously, this is John's brief, not my brief, but it's a review of the situation and there'll be more development and uh, detail to come. But you accept, as a lawyer, we're a very big job unpicking those huge contracts, billions and billions of pounds. Well, John, I think we have to accept that there are very real concerns about the way those contracts have played out in, in reality and concerns about the money that they have cost. And I think it's right in those circumstances to say it is a big issue uh, and there's got to be a review and that's what we're doing, reviewing. Are you hungry for power? Yes, I want the next election as soon as possible uh, so that we can get on implementing our manifesto and most importantly for my brief so that we can adopt a different approach to Brexit which will be much more constructive and progressive for the future. Keir Starmer, thank you very much thank indeed you. for joining us. And Labour Ch Shadow Chancellor John McDonnell's speech also covered the long-term costs of writing off student debt. Channel 4 News Fact Check team has been crunching the numbers. For full details, do go to our website, channel4.com forward slash fact check. Now, back in the 1990s, women constitute less than 10% of Labour's MPs, and the party embarked upon a much criticised policy of all women shortlists to try to shift the balance. The tactic was used in the 1997 landslide election, allowing it to bring in 100 women MPs. Now there are new tensions over the idea. I'm joined now by our political correspondent, Michael Crick. Michael, what's going on? Well, Labour bigwigs think it's possible there could be a general election within the next few months. And last decision, last week, the National Executive took the decision that in uh, Labour's top 75 target seats in England, they're going to choose candidates by the end of January and, and also in, in Scotland uh, and in Wales. And they took the decision that in, with the English seats, that 60% of those candidates will be chosen from all women shortlist. Now, this has caused something of an outcry from many black and uh, Asian uh, activists within the party because in four of the seats, Telford, Chingford, uh, Harrow East and in Putney, there were Asian candidates in June who, in most cases, considerably reduced the Conservative majorities and came close to winning. They think on the basis of their experience and reputation locally, they should be given another chance to fight those seats. This decision will stop them from doing so. One of them, uh, Niraj Patil, uh, a, a hospital consultant, he resigned his job to fight Putney. He wants another chance to fight the education secretary in, in Putney. 
I am confident having reduced the margin of Justine Grinning from 10,000 to 1,154. I am confident my Labour Party members will give me one more opportunity to fight and defeat Justine Grinning. But you won't be allowed to, to be a contender this time because it's going to be an all women shortlist. Yes, it is. You know, I'm very sad. I'm very disappointed because what Labour Party must also understand is black ethnic minorities are also so equally underrepresented. I do understand women are underrepresented. At the same time, black ethnic minorities are even more underrepresented. So this is totally unfair. Michael Crick, more to add? Well, I mean, if Labour were to go ahead with this and, and uh, choose these uh, women, uh, all women shortlists, it could mean at the next election they achieve parity between men and women in their ranks in the House of Commons. But black and, and, and Asian activists are saying, yeah, but it will be at their expense. Uh, I've spoken to a senior party official today. It may come up at the NEC tomorrow, but they're adamant uh, that the policy is not going to be changed. Michael Crick. One of the more memorable refrains heard at this year's general election, not to mention the Glastonbury Festival, was the chant of support of Jeremy Corbyn. Here at conference, you can hear it just about everywhere you go. Though not everyone is joining in, as our political correspondent Michael Crick has been finding out. The anthem's infectious, from Glastonbury in June to Brighton in September. Rarely can a leader have been so worshipped, with sceptics under pressure to join in, including yesterday Deputy Leader Tom Watson, plainly ill at ease. In the Labour Party's shop, Corbyn shirts, badges, mugs and even football-style scarves. Oh, Jeremy Corbyn, it says. I don't remember there being scarves to Tony Blair or Gordon Brown or Ed Miliband. Yeah. You can buy them in the shop. You're going to wear it. <laughs> it's fantastic. You're giving it to me. It's a well, I don't think we are. I just, you're going you're gonna to wear it. Now, what about the song? Can you sing the song? No, I'm not, not going to do it. I am not oh, going to do it. Oh, Jeremy, come on, come on. You can do it. <laughs> oh, Jeremy Corbyn. <laughs> I wish I could sing, because he deserves better than that. <laughs> Lord Prescott, have you, uh, have you seen these Jeremy Corbyn scarves? Come on, let's have the song. Come on, you can Whoa, do it. Oh, Jeremy Corbyn. Yeah, no, go on. <laughs> Come on. Oh, oh Jeremy Corbyn. This hero worship, they tried it with Tony Blair, and I thought that was bad. A bit cringeworthy. So, I think I'll... I'll actually defer. You've got to get the beat. Oh, Jeremy Corbyn. We're not a cult. What I was going to say, isn't this all a bit dangerous? You know, it would be if, you see, when people do this, what they're saying is up yours to neoliberalism, up yours to more uh, offensive wars, up yours to privatisation. Isn't this all a bit sort of cult of the personality? Yeah, that's fine by me. Fine, that's by, fine you. by me. Can lead to dangerous things, that Stalin, Mao. Well, of course, Kim but he's, are you comparing him to those? Well, I'm just saying personality cults too dang lead to dangerous things. Yeah, well, I wouldn't necessarily call him a cult, but I think it's nice to have a, um, a leader who's authentic and who we can trust, and I think that's why he, so many people have connected with him. I'm not going to let you have it. <laughs> this is mine. Now, you've got, everybody, you've got, oh, yeah, we're on camera, yeah. right, with Michael giving me this. He gave it to me. I'm going to take it now. Thank you. Fair enough. I, I look forward to uh, You'll get seeing, another one. seeing you with it. Uh. Michael Crick, irresistibly on the march. I'm joined now by Huda Elmi, a member of Momentum's National Coordinating Group, and Richard Angel, Director of Progress, a centrist Labour pressure group. So, kind of on the right, slightly, yeah, and on the left. left. Right. Um, but, but both left of centre, but you more right, of, right than we're she all, is. We're the centre-left. We're all one happy family. But would you ever hear your, your followers saying, oh, Jeremy Colvin, singing that song? We're, we're jubilant that Labour is on the up, that we gained three million votes That's in not the same seats. as singing as, ooh, Jeremy Corbyn. Well, we're Labour through and through, like a piece of Brighton rock. You cut us in half and we're Labour through the middle, and that we're jubilant about. But we're keen here at conference to discuss the issues about what's going to get us over the line next mm. time and deprive the Tories of government. Now, I, I mean, the focus. Momentum is being described as a party within a party. 
No, well, I would disagree with that. I think that uh, this is a conference in which we have more than a thousand delegates coming. You know, this is exactly what we wanted when we said we wanted a member-led, transformative organisation. The Labour Party has made massive gains during the general election. I think it's building on that. It's a dramatic shift towards making this uh, a social force uh, within the UK. Well, what, what is the purpose of the social force? I mean, is the social force designed to shift Labour in a certain direction? It's designed to, to reflect exactly what ordinary people are talking about. Everything from the NHS to social care, to privatisation, all, you know, all of that sort of stuff, talking about the really, really big but, issues. How oh, very interesting that you're not going to talk about Brexit. Well, I, I, well, I was this morning actually in a Brexit debate. No, no, so but you didn't mention it in this cascade of things that you're going to talk about. Like I said, we're talking about re re reflecting what ordinary people are talking about. And but they're they talking are about ordinary people are talking about Brexit, and this, but you're not. And this, if you walk because, around conference... Because, you, like the rest of the party, momentum is split. No, if you walk around conference, John, you'll see that Brexit have, is everywhere. and some it's older palpable. momentum people... Palpable. are very anti-European, but some of the younger ones are passionate about supporting. We are completely reflecting what ordinary people are talking about, and that is Brexit included into that, mm -hmm. which is palpable around conference. The TWT, mm -hmm. the World Transformed, you know, we had many a Brexit panels, we had prominent MPs okay. talking about it. We definitely well, want the dialogue. Richard, let's uh, now, now talk about the Brexit debate. And do you not find it curious that this passionate issue, after all the biggest constitutional issue of the last 50 years in this country, with massive economic implications, is not being fully debated on the floor of this conference. I find it totally bizarre that the issue that everyone is talking about out on the public, that whether their jobs are dependent on their future, their prosperity, is not being discussed by the party of Labour here this week in Brighton. And you have got a situation where the momentum leadership broadly is that Benite left from the 70s and 80s as anti-European, and the young Corbynistas want us to have a pro-European future. But they've saved Jeremy Corbyn's blushes uh, this week by doing a bit of a fix uh, to stop it becoming up on the conference agenda. And I think you know, that well, young woman... Who do you woman blame your... for this bit of a fix? Well, clearly the momentum leads you put out. They told people... It's all your don't fault. Worry. Brexit would come up and get debated anyway, and it hasn't. We've been able to clap some pretty good speeches and make a few complaints, but not shape the policy. We, we have advised our members to talk about everything, from the NHS to but Brexit. But not shape it. But, but, we but are asking, asking, we are shaping it through dialogue. We shape it through dialogue, so, John. But and we're democracy having democracy is supposed to be about how we vote on things. There was the opportunity to commit Labour to being in the single market. That was denied from us today because Momentum said, don't worry, that's definitely being discussed. Talk about these other issues. Those issues aren't controversial. What do we disagree with? With on social care, we as, don't. As Tell him, what do you agree Brexit with? It's huge and it's really important to all of our Brexit country. is being talked about. I actually would invite you to the World Transform because it is being talked about. It's being talked about loudly all across conferences. All right, what is and Motor Momentum's position on Brexit? Does it support the single market? Brexit doesn't have any policy. I mean, sorry, Momentum doesn't have any policy positions. It doesn't make them. What we well, do do is echo what the Labour Party is trying to do. Right, let me ask a more credible. It is credible. It is credible. Let me ask a more controversial echo, question. What, what is direction? Momentum's position on freedom of movement? We don't have any policy positions. What we do do is reflect what the Labour Party is doing more generally on everything from the NHS to Brexit, talking about social care, talking about education, talking about free education. We're talking about all of those things because that's okay. the direction the Labour Party is taking. Exactly. Exactly. We echo exactly Labour Party policy. We what represent what exactly Labour Party is talking about. What we, we, what what exactly what we don't hear from you Brexit. is any challenge to the Labour Party's main thrust, which is not to discuss. Brexit in this conference? Not at all. Our delegates were out there making the case, trying to uh, expose the fact that they were promised a debate that would be binding and that it hasn't come but, forward. Well, what does uh, progress happen? want in terms of a Brexit uh, offer? To we have them? got to keep this country in the single market. That is the future for people's jobs, their opportunities and how they get the most out of being near that trading partner and being able to stop the race to the bottom that is happening in all capitalist mm -hmm. economies that means that working class people continue to lose out Are to you international not describing capitalists. a party which quite frankly is as divided as a Conservative Party but are better at hiding it? I, we've all got very, very different opinions and we're very strong about it. The opportunity to put that to conference, democratically settle that debate has not been allowed at this conference and that means the debate will rumble on. Well, like I said, it is being talked about at a conference. It's palpable, literally, outside all the fringes. What the people outside on, this palpable. conference would like to but know also, is what is the morning, position of the Labour Party? This morning, I was there. I was there this morning. We were talking about Brexit. Well, the, the position currently on Brexit is that we are leaving. OK, we are leaving the European Union. Huda, and on sorry. that note, I'm afraid we must end. But thank you both, Richard and thank Huda. You so thank so you very much, much indeed. Well, here in Brighton, the Labour leadership wanted to concentrate on the big announcements which confirm, if confirmation were needed, that Jeremy Corbyn has stamped his desert boots on Blairism and crushed it into the ground. Statism is back with a vengeance. First, 
nationalization, rail, followed by water, followed by energy. And then the Shadow Chancellor announced the death knell of PFI. Another big idea embraced by the Blair government to ensure that hospitals and schools were built ahead of schedule. There will be no new PFIs and a Labour government would apparently buy some of the existing contracts back, though no price tag was mentioned. There was wild enthusiasm for the delegates in marked contrast to the atmosphere in the hall during the morning's contributions on Brexit, a debate which was deeply divided. But there was no vote. That had been finagled away by the Conference Arrangements Committee. Here's our political editor, Nick Watt. This is a party on the move after a momentous battle for the soul of Labour. Now, two years after he startled the British establishment with victory in his first leadership contest, Jeremy Corbyn has secured almost complete command of the Labour Party. The Labour movement rose to its feet as John McDonnell outlined a programme of government intervention that would have been laughed out of court just a few years ago. The biggest idea was a plan to dismantle the private finance initiative which has been used by Labour and Tory governments to fund public services. So let me give you this commitment. We'll put an end to this scandal and we'll reduce the costs of the taxpayers. How? Well, we've already pledged that there will be no new PFI deals signed by us in government, but we'll go further. And I can tell you today, it's what you've been calling for. We'll bring existing PFI contracts back in-house. We're bringing them back. We're bringing them back. So heartfelt applause for John McDonnell there as he announced that a future Labour government would embark on a major programme of public investment, would take core industries back into public control and would dismantle the private finance initiative. John McDonnell and Jeremy Corbyn have dreamed for decades about taking control of the Labour Party. This conference marks the moment when they have finally achieved their historic goal. Against that, in order to get One of the architects of New Labour's PFI programme was encouraged because he says the original plan was flawed. The trouble was it then went into hospitals. And once you got into hospital, there's no income flow. Bankers will loan you money as long as they got the first priority on the money supply. That's not the same in hospitals. And my fear was that what will happen then, they'll start building and then they will start running. And then we've got a situation of high interest rates, high profits, and a massive problem now about huge debts on the health service. Uh, that's a problem that presumably John's addressing himself to, and quite rightly so. Labour veterans now feel they have their party back. I'm telling you, the party and the leadership is alive. And you've dreamt for decades, you've dreamt for decades to hear a leadership talking about taking the railways back into state ownership. Yes. Public investment. And now it's as natural as night following day, isn't it? And it's so simple, and that's what Nye Bevan and Clem Attlee did in 1945. And do you know at the end of that five years period? Unemployment was down to 2.2%. The country was skint, and yet somehow or other, they did all those wonderful things, including education, free for all, from the cradle to the grave. I think what you're seeing is an absolute rejection by, uh, by so many people, not only in the UK, but across uh, Europe, uh, a, a position whereby people have rejected austerity. People are fed up with austerity and Labour offer an alternative. Dotted around the lanes and alleys of Brighton, the Corbyn supporting Momentum Group is running its own rolling conference at a series of venues. I think um, kind of now that there's, there's been a bit more of a legitimization of the, the Corbyn movement, now we're kind of focusing on having those very key conversations about, you know, Labour's on the, potentially on the brink of government. When that happens, what do we want to see? You know, what kind of, what kind of world do we want to live in? This is, of course, a Labour conference, which means a split is never far away. Pro-Europeans, including some MPs who are not exactly Jeremy Corbyn's largest fans, were furious when they were blocked from staging a vote to change party policy in favour of membership of the European single market after Brexit. Um, what, what I want, I want to do is first off congratulate, congratulate conference. Yesterday you voted away your chance to remain in the single market. You voted away your chance to stay in the EU. And you voted away your chance 
to stop this disastrous Brexit. This, this Labour administration, we're not even administration, with the opposition, we will be remembered as the opposition that let the Tories do what they want with Brexit. Corbyn supporters dismiss the critics on the grounds that they're using Brexit as a proxy to attack a leader whose authority they will never accept. The pro-Europeans, who once held sway in the party, are a diminished force here in Brighton. But they do still have numbers in Parliament. Labour is sailing into a new era on a gentle sea breeze. For now, the tables have been turned, as figures who once sat in the Labour mainstream swap places on the margins with Corbyn supporters. Well, Nick is here, so too is Chris Cooker, our policy editor. And we're going to bring in with PFI. How big a deal is this, actually? So, it's a big idea, sort of intellectually. It shows the state, as you say, is really coming back. It's also a horribly complicated idea. So, John McDonald's talked about, basically, quite tough about uh, how he's going to name a price, Parliament's going to set the price, and the people who own these contracts are going to be bought out. The thing is, if you think through the political context in which he's going to be doing this, it's actually going to be a time when we're going to be, as a country, trying to bring in foreign investment after Brexit. We're going to try and show we're a nice place to put your money. My strong suspicion is he's going to want to be quite consensual about all of this, and that means dealing with the thousands of people who have invested in these contracts. Yeah, and they're going to, it's going to cost a lot. Presumably, he's going to have to borrow a lot. But there's 700 plus PFIs. So how much is it going to cost? So we know that the sort of total capital value of the PFI contracts is about 60 billion pounds. But it's important to note that it doesn't mean that even if you were to buy out all of the contracts, it would necessarily cost 60 billion pounds. It will certainly cost less. To understand why, we've cooked up a hypothetical to help you take through it. Imagine we have a hospital where we're paying £5 million a year for 20 years to have a company put up and maintain a building. So £100 million in total. There are lots of ways to structure a buyout, but we'll need to make sure we cover the cost of the building so we can still use it. Let's say in our case, that's £50 million. Then we'll probably need to cover the profit margin that the contractor expected. Let's say that's £15 million. So buying out our fictional £100 million contract might actually cost about £65 million. But the state will then actually have to run that building. So what that really tells you is uh, that, I mean, we've made up that, fi uh, that fictional example. But whether it's um, a project resurfacing roads mm -hmm. or running hospitals, all of those little uh, bits we put in there will change dramatically. Each one will be totally different. Some of the contracts are overpriced, some are underpriced. Uh, so actually working out how much this is going to cost is going to take years. Thanks very much indeed. Now, Nick, let's look ahead to tomorrow. What's the big day tomorrow? Well, as I was saying in my film, and as you were saying, what this conference shows us is this is now definitively Jeremy Corbyn's party. And tomorrow, we will see the passage of two rule changes which will strengthen his control over the party. In the first place, when there's another leadership contest, and we're not expecting one in the near future, you will, in order to get onto the ballot, you will not need the support of 15% of Labour MPs. You'll need 10%. That's designed to increase the chance of getting a left-wing candidate on the ballot. The leadership had wanted at 5%. They've compromised. And the other change is that they will expand the National Executive Committee of the Labour Party. These are gentle steps ahead of bigger steps next year. But interestingly, I was talking to one long-standing Je Jeremy Corbyn supporter. This person said to me, this sounds like a stitch-up mm. from the elite. And all these new members of the Labour Party joined because they wanted to do change from the bottom. But this person did say to me, at least it's a step in the right direction. Now, another big change is that not Normally we hear from the leader on Tuesday, but they've changed that. That's right. Well, the electrifying moment last year was Tom Watson's speech, and we'll get his speech tomorrow. Last year, just after Jeremy Corbyn had won that second contest, um, Tom Watson said, we cannot carry on trashing Tony Blair and Gordon Brown. That's not how you win an election. Very different speech tomorrow, I'm told. It would be like Sadiq Khan's speech today, where Sadiq, praised, Sadiq Khan praised Jeremy Corbyn for that election win. I think what we'll hear from Tom Watson is Jeremy Corbyn defied expectations. He didn't win the election, but he did really well. And the momentum, excuse the pun, is now behind Labour in large part because of Jeremy Corbyn's appeal. Thank you both very much indeed. Well, one of the trickiest issues here in Brighton, the cause of the baring of teeth and the clashes between the old guard and new, is that of Brexit. 
Emily Thornby is Shadow Foreign Secretary. I caught up with her earlier today. Emily Thornbury, a uh, former Labour leadership candidate, said that the failure to have a vote on Brexit policy and a proper debate was a slap in the face for democracy. Yeah, it's exactly the opposite. So what happens is that the constituency parties put in various motions and then the delegates vote on what it is that they want to have a debate and a vote on. We had a debate in the hall this morning on foreign policy and uh, there was a lot of discussion about Brexit, but there wasn't and a vote. deep divisions over Brexit. Well, yes, but the, but the point is, is that the delegates decided what we were going to vote on. But part of the way the delegates came to that decision was, as you'll know, an email from Momentum on Saturday uh, urging people to vote in a certain, uh, to, to specify in a certain order what the debate should be leaving Brexit way down the line. Now, that's not grassroots freedom, is it? Well, yes, it is, because, is it? of course, have you ever met a Labour Party member? Have you ever tried to tell them what to do? They will do what they think is the best thing to do, and they want to vote on things where they feel they can make a contribution and where a vote will make a difference. And it may well be, and I hope this is the case, that the majority of delegates, in fact, feel that Labour has a position which is, which is important and certainly in contrast to the governments and that we do not need to be voting on specific elements of that policy now. You would like perhaps to see a snap election within even a few months so you would then be if you won you would be the party of government. So let's go through a few things. Are you in favour of saying the single market? I think that what we should be doing is we should be putting the interest of the economy first and foremost and the safety and security of our citizens. Yeah, but that, now, you when can say that any time, any decade. No, 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 no. We have said that we are not sweeping anything off the table because this is a negotiation. Right. This is a negotiation. Now, nobody pretends that the referendum was not, and an important part of that was immigration, and nobody pretends that there is not a problem with staying in the single market if the interpretation of freedom of movement is as it has been until now. So that you therefore um, rule out any situation where you stay in the single market if that means free movement. That's absolutely out. Nothing is being swept you off the table. But what we are saying is that is that we need to look again at freedom of movement. We need to make sure that we have fair rules and manage migration. And we will be negotiating with the European Union, whereby we do need to have changes to our rules. We do need to have a clearer idea. Well, what would you of give up then? What would you give up if you wanted to remain in the single market, but corral free movement in some way? You'd have to be able to give something back. You can't take everything. What would you give back? We are so many steps away from sitting at a table with the European Union and negotiating that it would be wrong at this stage for me to be sitting here with you, much as I'd like to, and start talking about red lines. Remember a year ago? Remember a year ago when Theresa May stood up at Tory party conference and started spraying red lines around? She has completely boxed herself in and has not allowed herself to be able to negotiate I properly as a result. That. I We're not, we that. learn these lessons. You learn these lessons, but the, the problem is that people actually don't know what Labour's position is beyond a period of transition. So, for example, I'm asking this straightforwardly. Do you rule out remaining in the single market? We are not sweeping anything off the table, and we will go into negotiations in good faith. But part of that has to be taking with us the message that we got from the British people, which is that we need to look again at the rules around migration. Um, Jeremy Corbyn uh, said yesterday the single market has within it restrictions on state aid and state spending and pressure on it. I think we need to be very careful what powers we need as a national government. He's got a point. Yes. Yes. And the difficulty is to what extent it's a, it's a real fear and to what extent it's, a, it's one which was, which was puffed up, frankly, by the British Civil Service. When we were in government, there were many times in which we wanted to be able to get maximum bang for our buck. So, for example, if a, if a, if a council wanted to take out, like they were going to take out, they were going to have a contract with a private contractor, we wanted to be able to say, get some apprentices, you know, make sure you're paying the living wage. And we were told at that point by civil servants that that was contrary to EU competition law. Now, the question really is, is that actually true or is it a very conservative interpretation of the rules? These are the sorts of things we need to look at because we do not want to hamper our ability to be able to spend state money as effectively as possible. So there may be quite stark choices to make for Labour and you have to maybe make them very, very soon. I mean, I understand, of course, that you, know, you do want to be vague 
that's what you're being. You're being vague. You I'm might being, say... I'm being honest. And vague. I'm being practical. And vague. I'm being as straightforward as I can be in the interest of the country. But in the interest of the country, you would like to see a Labour government and you would like to see a snap election. So you may be in a position of having to implement policy in less than six months. Where is policy on Europe going to be made if it's not made here in the great democracy of the new Labour Party? It's being made in conjunction with our membership. We have many conversations. It's made every time we talk to people on the doorstep. Emily Thornby, thank you. Well, with me now is Chuka Amuna, a one-time leadership candidate and shadow business secretary, who was one of those MPs heading calls this weekend for the party to change policy on Brexit. And Rhea Wolfson, Momentum-backed member of the National Executive Committee, who has pushed for that voting rule change. Good evening to you both. Um, Chuka Amuna, you and I have been at many uh, Labour parties uh, conferences mm. before. Uh, people are saying this one is full of energy, this one is full of unity. We hear that Tom Watson is going to be delivering a herogram tomorrow. Sadiq can deliver the herogram now, <laughs> yes. To, to, do you agree with all that? Well, look, it's great to gather with a huge sense of possibility that there will be a Labour government sometime soon. So wherever you are on the Labour spectrum, everybody is happy about that. But I think whilst there's positivity and delight at the fact that we did a hell of a lot better at the general election than many expected across the board, I think we approached the task that we've got ahead of us with humility. We've got to get 64 more MPs. The Labour Party, in many respects, at its best in June this year with its leader, at his very best, we did really well, but we failed to get more MPs than the Tories, which means we're not in government. Yeah. So we all, you know, I think everybody's focused on that goal. But you have said that uh, you warned Jeremy Corbyn not to overpromise and underdeliver. Well, I think now what's... he's promising a lot, and he's even yeah. promised a lot today. I mean, yes. do you see this as a government in waiting right now? I think we have to be a government in waiting. That is our role as an opposition, but we have to also prioritise. And I think, you know, we want to do, of course, everything in the manifesto, but we're not going to be able to do it all in the first year. So there are going to be some hard choices to be made about what we do first. You know, uh, we've got a big uh, tuition fee uh, scrap uh, pledge, but we also want to do universal childcare. We've got the PFI announcement that's been done today. So look, we can do those things, but we need to be clear what we're going to do first. Well, uh, Rhea Wilson, just let me put uh, a, a recent independent uh, poll, BMG poll. You know, in terms of what the, the public wants, the backing for status policies, yes, 69% want a, an executive pay camp, yes, 58% want tuition fees to go, yes, 57% want nationalised utilities, but only 33% consider Jeremy Corbyn's party a party able to deliver that. Well, I think, firstly, we have to look at our vote share in the last general election because that's ultimately what's what's important. That's the best polling we can ever do. But you lost. Um, we did lose, but it is, I think, given the the snap, the nature of the snap election, going from where we went, where we started at the beginning of that, when that snap election was called and where we ended up, you know, who could have said if that snap election had gone on for another week, another two weeks? And what actually we are doing is continuing that election campaign because that's what Jeremy's great at, campaigning, convincing people. But is, is, is Oki talking in here and sounding sure. almost like it's one in here? But as Chukamuna says, there's a lot of work to do outside and you can't deliver everything. There's a lot of work to be done outside, but as you said, you know, what the public saw is the more they saw Jeremy Corbyn, the more they liked him. And that's, that's, our, that's our power at the moment, is to give as much exposure to, to Jeremy Corbyn as possible. Yeah, but, but, but what people are also seeing is the issue of Brexit not being voted on in this hall, partly because Momentum sent out an email to people saying, this is the list of the votes that we would like to be uh, cast and we want to put Brexit right down there. Now, you think that was a mistake? I think, look, I think it's a shame, but, you know, the, the current leadership will not be any different from the other leaderships which want to avoid having a vote on issues that potentially don't go their way. That's, no, that's, nothing, that's nothing new. But for me, the, the issue here is the principle, and it was interesting mm. seeing the package, because my own view is I'm very pleased that the Labour Party leadership moved our position during transition, uh, during this Brexit process, to one where we want to stay in the single market and the customs union. I would like to see that be our permanent position. I'm pleased with the change, but I want to nudge it along to the next stage. And the reason why is not just because of the jobs element to this. The difference between having access to the single market and membership of it is anybody can access the single market, but with membership, we're part of a framework of rules and protections for employees, consumers, and the environment that sets the floor 
and enables us to get this thing called globalisation to work better for lower middle income people in our country. That's why this matters. It's a social justice argument. That's why we're, you know, people like me being a real pain in the arse in a yeah. way for the leadership of this because th we're arguing from that position. But again, you're talking to the hall if you're not talking about an actual Brexit. Well, you need to convince people in the country and it doesn't look like you're prepared to have an open, proper discussion about it and a vote at the end. Well, actually, I think firstly that's not an accurate characterisation of what happened today. Firstly, there was a conversation about Brexit. There was also a motion put by the National Executive Committee that was voted on. But as well, I think we have to look at what our members who are representative of society, they really are, we not quite past the 600,000 mark, but I'm confident we will soon, wanted to have a conversation with and what our priorities were in you know, this debate. And you say it was a, an email sent out by Momentum, but ultimately we've got a huge amount of delegates. We've got, not all delegates, but we've got over 12,000 people attending this conference. But it's the defining, it's the defining policy for a whole it generation. We, we can't Germany. duck this issue. Um, we have to lead on it. I totally understand why all the shenanigans went on to prevent mm. the freedom of movement and single market motions being discussed. Like I said, all leaderships do that. But what I'm clear about is the country is looking to the Labour Party to lead on this issue. And we can do so whilst respecting the result of the referendum in 2016. And let's not forget in 2017, Theresa May put the prospect of us being yanked out of the single market and the customs union to the people at, at the general election. She did not get a mandate for that. So now we've got to take advantage of that and make the argument for social justice and to protect your viewers' jobs. We can do that. So let's grab it. Let's do it. That's my argument. Thank you both very much indeed. I've been